Tonight, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am honored to welcome Joseph O'Connor to discuss his new book, Ghost Light. This lyrical novel opens with an aging actress crossing a city, spilling over with detail, such as women looking like boxers disguised as society flappers in a picture the Marx Brothers never made. Molly Allgood is surviving in London and sifting through her tumultuous past. Her reminiscences carry her to the stages of Dublin, where she started her spectacular career and the place she began a fiery affair with Irish playwright John Millington Singh. In a glowing review, the Daily Telegraph calls Ghostlight delicately wrought, with each part interlinking and making a beautiful whole. The novel comes to an acutely moving climax, a fitting end to a haunting book about the lasting importance of memory and the absurdity of love. Joseph O'Connor has written six previous novels, and his first book, Cowboys and Indians, was shortlisted for the Whitbread Prize. Star of the Sea, published in 2002, won the Irish Post Award for Literature and received international acclaim. Mr. O'Connor was born in Dublin, and his writings have been translated into 35 languages. I'll now turn the introductions over to the Vice Consul of Ireland, Ms. Deidre Ní Haloon. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you all for being here. I'm just going to say a few brief words. Um, first of all, to welcome Joe to Boston on behalf of the Irish Consulate. We're very honoured and proud that you're here. Um, this event is taking place as part of a series of events which are taking place across the United States this year as part of an Irish government initiative called Imagine Ireland. So there'll be a lot of events taking place here in Massachusetts, including a classical music event this coming Friday in MIT and uh, various other cultural events promoting contemporary Irish culture, whether dramatic, uh, dance, music, literary. So I would urge you all to check out the website, which is www.imagineireland.ie and you can check out what events are happening uh, in the state you, you reside in. So as I say, we're uh, delighted to welcome Joe. Thanks for being here and we're looking forward to the reading. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much, um, Ryan and Deirdre, for those lovely introductions. I want to um, particularly thank Deirdre for being here tonight and for sponsoring the little reception, so make sure you stay and have a drink afterwards. Um, she mentioned Imagine Ireland, the initiative of Culture Ireland, a branch of the Irish government that uh, promotes Irish culture abroad, and as part of that, I'm told that um, the government is sending 1,000 Irish artists to the United States this year. I didn't know we had 1,000 Irish artists. Um, I, I, I'm certain the way things are in Ireland, I'm not sure we've got the funding to pay for them to come home again, so you may be stuck with them for a while. Um, but it's a wonderful thing. You know, Ireland is going through some difficult times, but um, one of the greatest inheritances that we have and a thing that has sustained people and a thing that has brought dignity and honour to Ireland all over the world through very difficult times before has been this magnificent inheritance of our culture um, which has really been part of our gift to the world. So I would encourage you to support um, these events because there are some really wonderful people heading towards your shores. So I'm going to read to you a little bit from this novel of mine, Ghost Light, which Ryan told you a little bit about, um, just to contextualise it slightly more for you. As Ryan mentioned, this novel, it's loosely based on real-life events um, in, the li in the life of one of our truly great writers, a man called John Millington Singh, who wrote a play that some of you will have seen, called The Playboy of the Western World. The first really important Irish play of the 20th century. And Singh, in real life, was a rather reticent, um, buttoned up, a slightly damaged man. He never knew his father, um, who died when he was a baby. He was raised in wealth, you know, and with privilege, but... Um, with a certain amount of loneliness too. His mother was a very strict puritanical 
religious person. And Singh read the works of Darwin as a teenager of 15 or 16 and suffered a very extreme crisis of faith. And he knew that this would separate him from his family. He had been hurt in love a few times as a young man, as most of us were a few times when we were young indeed. But uh, there was um, there seems to have been something in Singh's childhood that never gave him the capacity to recover from those hurts. So he was a lonely man. And um, there's a beautiful phrase about him in a poem by Seamus Heaney, where he, Heaney says that loneliness was his passport through the world. You know, it was really how he presented himself to the world. So Singh and the great poet William Butler Yeats and the great writer and intellectual Lady Gregory were involved in the early years of the 20th century with the founding of the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, a place where some of you will have been, a really remarkable institution, the National Theatre of Ireland, which came into existence before the nation itself legally came to be. And it was through that that in the last years of his life, Singh met and fell tempestuously in love with a much younger woman. She was a teenager when they met, um, a woman called Molly Allgood, which is um, it's a beautiful name, isn't it? I, I sometimes think that one of the reasons I wrote Ghostlight is that if you're called Molly Allgood, somebody should write a novel about you. <laughs> Molly was um, a Catholic for Singh was Protestant. She was from the inner city of Dublin, from the tenement district that Sean O'Casey wrote about, the part of town that my own grandparents were from. And as well as the differences of class and background, temperamentally, she was very different to Singh. She was extremely fiery, flirtatious, lighthearted, full of the kind of spark and the fire that people from, from cities tend to have. And um, so on paper, these two people could not possibly have had a relationship. But we all know that um, the song of heart's desire is the sweetest song of all, and all sorts of wonderful things happen when people fall in love. And so it was that in the last few years of Singh's life, he and Molly had this secretive affair. Singh died when he was 37 um, of uh, Hodgkin's disease, something that had beset him pretty much for his whole life. But Molly lived to be an elderly woman. She lived right into the 1950s. She continued to act. And as Ghost Light begins, I have to say now, these are fictional characters. They're based loosely on the real uh, Singh and the real Molly. But as Ghost Light begins, we find her as an elderly woman living in London in 1952 when the city has not yet been rebuilt, really, after the bombings of the Second World War. And she's elderly, as I say, she's a bit down on her luck, and her great performances are behind her, and she likes the odd drop to drink by way of consolation. And um, she wakes up one morning um, with a memory of this man who was so important to her all those years ago. And the novel traces what she does on this day in 1952 and how she remembers the past and how she tries to process it. So I'm going to read three brief extracts. Um, I think that's all you need to know. Oh yes, um, Singh and Molly had little um, endearments for each other as, as lovers sometimes do. Singh used to call him, or Molly used to call him Tramp as a sort of ironic mockery of his prosperous background, old tramp, she used to call him. And he used to call her changeling, a rather Im ambiguous um, endearment. It's from Irish folklore. And if you have the ability to change your form, as some of the fairy folk do, then, um, then you're a changeling. But, but I, I think it really, um, it really relates to Molly's um, changeable nature. Um, and the tempestuous arguments they used to sometimes have. So I'm going to read a bit from 1952, from the opening of the book. Then I'm going to read a flashback to a day in their courtship back in 1908. And I'm going to finish the third reading when I get to that. is from the epilogue of the book. Um, and that's in the form of a letter that Molly wrote as a, as a young woman. So I'm not going to reveal what happens at the end, but suffice it to say that many years later, 
many years after both participants in this love affair have died, someone is going through Molly's papers and they find an old letter that, that she wrote and never sent. So, so there we are. <clears throat> so this is from Ghostlight. Chapter one. <coughs> A lodging house room in London. 27th of October, 1952, 6.43 a.m. In the top floor room of the dilapidated townhouse across the terrace, a light has been on all night. From your bed, it was visible whenever you turned towards the window, which you had to do in order to fetch your bottle from the floor. Most nights the same. The bulb is lighted at dusk. In the mornings, a couple of moments after the street lamps flicker out, it dies and the ragged curtain is closed. You are 65 now, perhaps the age of that house, perhaps even a little older. What a thought. You approach your only window. It is shockingly cold to the touch. Winter is coming to England. The weather has been bitter. Last night, a hurricane struck London. You have never noticed anyone enter or exit that forlorn house, but the postman still delivers to it, stuffing envelopes through the broken glass in the door panel. The letterbox has been nailed closed many years. Men urinate in the porch. One of the street girls plies her trade there, and the balustrade has long been splashed with obscene words. Many of the window embrasures are boarded, Weeds sprout from the façade. You have a sense that the occupant of the room is a man. For one midnight, a fleeting shadow crossed the upper window pane, so you thought, and there was maleness in how it moved. There was a time when you used to think about him. How can he live alone in a bomb-blasted old house? Who sends the letters? What are they about? for it helped to pass the brutal hours immediately preceding dawn. But this morning, someone else has come to you again, out of the same light somehow, out of an unseen room, out of a city you have lived in the last 13 years, but have never found a reason to call your own. This has happened to all of us, a coasting across the mind by one we had thought forgotten or purposefully banished. But today will prove him a wanderer reluctant to be exiled, an emigrant still attempting to come home. He could be difficult sometimes. What use in denying it? Irritable, unforgiving for a relatively young man. Because the whisperers and gossips and sniggerers always made such a point of the age difference between you. Envious vixens, triple-chinned hypocrites, too deceitful to utter their true objection. For what are years, fictions, ink stains on a calendar? There are moments of late when yesterday feels a life ago, and tomorrow an unborn century, so unreachable it seems. And had he lived beyond his youth, the years would have contracted, because a married couple become the same age, grow to resemble one another over time, like bookends, their recollections in grayed bindings between them, and neither bothering to read what once divided them. What's this he'd be now? Eighty, something, a slippered old duffer, a shuffler, an old bags. Hard to work the calculation through the fog of a hangover. Your reckoning of the decades keeps stalling, tripping up, and after a few ruined attempts, you abandon it. You take a small, sour sip, medicinal, just a settler. The reek of gin dampens your eyes, somehow intensifies his presence, but you grimace it away with a swallow. The daily spite of this unmannerly town. Wasn't it Yeats wrote that? Or my other lunk, Shaw. Dublin he was whining about. But all towns are unmannerly to the old, the poor, the collaborator. What is it in poets that must dress a thing up? 
Christ, they'd nearly call their dandruff the fairy snow. <laughs> Not long after dawn, the shadow kissing time. Grey light at the window and the whistle of the kettle as you move about, failing to keep warm. Mittens flittered to ribbons. You wear a dead man's boots. Well, no point in wastefulness, a sin. Down below in Brickfield's terrace, a milk wagon is delivering. And you wonder would the man advance you another month's credit, but the fear of being declined dissuades you. Frost silvers the pavement, the telephone kiosk, the street, the wrecked colonnades of the house where the light burns all night, an awning over the grocers on the corner of Porchester Road. Rooks are circling the chimney breasts. You shuffle away from the window to the cubby hole by the cooking ring. The room smells of cabbage and dust. Somewhere below you, a wireless is playing too loudly, but you do not object to the interruption, find it oddly cheering sometimes. There are hours late at night when you miss its consolation. Silence can be frightening to the lonely. He always said you were over-imaginative, too given to fantasy, a Catholic trait, he would joke. These nights you read Mills and Boons from the Toppany Library in Earl's Court Road. Sure you'd be lost for a bit of an escape, only it wasn't for true romances. How he'd have hated them, your dog-eared and tear-stained bedfellows. Opium for spinsters, he'd mock. The sun would dry the oceans wide. Heaven would cease to be. The world would cease its motion, my love, ere I'd prove false to thee. A song on the radio that would draw the heart out of you, Molly, that anyone ever felt such devotion. Chapter 3 Kingstown a prosperous suburb of Dublin, 1908. There is a part of the garden by the cluster of sycamores, near the bend in the drive where the gravel is wearing thin. And if he stands there quietly on a still Sunday morning, when none of the servants is around to annoy him, and when mother is up in her room at her scriptures, he can hear the distant approach of the train from Dublin, the wind-borne shush and chug that means she might be coming to him again. He is thirty-six now, already very ill. Painful years have passed since he stopped believing he could be loved. The power of what is happening terrifies him. He leaves his mother's garden, makes hurriedly for Glenageary Station, up the willow-lined avenue, towards St. Paul's, Church of Ireland, past the entrance to the quarry lanes, known locally as the Metals, through which the granites were hefted long ago for the stanchions of Kingstown Pier. There are days when he feels hammered, his breathing sometimes knifes him, but punctuality is important, a sign of respect, he says. The walk from his mother's house takes about seven minutes. Often he arrives as the locomotive is chuntering to its screechy standstill and belching grimy spumes of cinders and mizzle. He skulks in the station portico, not daring to hope, lowering his eyes quickly if a neighbour happens past. It would not do to be seen, not yet, not here. There is the age difference between them, but that is not all. There are the differences that cannot be noticed in an instant. And then, where can she be? She materialises through the smoke. There she is, beckoning circumspectly from a second glass window. It is like a small moment out of Tolstoy, perhaps. One of those seemingly simple but reverberating images he values in the novels of Russia. He pictures her stepping down through the vapour, the soot, then hurrying along the platform to him, parasol in hand. She comes to him through the filth, her face hopeful and kind, the steam moistening a strand of hair to her forehead. 
But this cannot happen, for people might say. There would be talk around Glenageary. Instead, he boards the train, takes the bench opposite her in the carriage. They're like a couple of collaborators plotting an act of treason. Outside, the conductor is slamming the doors, a whistle is blown, a green flag is flourished. As the engine gives a shriek and they judder away from Glenageary, he begins to feel something like relief. From the pocket of her raincoat is protruding a play script. She uses the journey from the city to learn her lines. And nobody could say she is beautiful exactly, but she is an actress. She is able to decide whether to be beautiful or plain. Like a changeling, he calls her, his preferred endearment. Like many sweet nothings, an ambiguity. The train clatters into the tunnel at Killiney. He is alone with her in darkness. He feels her hand steal into his. This thrills him, charges him. No one can see. The moment passes quickly. There is a dazzle of light and the panorama of the bay is magnificent, Italian. Along the cliff tops at Shangana, a cormorant hangs in the air. It will not be too long before they come coasting into Bray, where nobody knows him. Bray is safe. Passers-by might think them a father and daughter as they exit Bray Station and she links him at the elbow and they go walking down the promenade in the direction of Bray Head through a swirl of dirty gulls and old newspapers. He looks older than his years. She looks younger than hers. He has achieved some recognition in the field of play writing. Translations of two of his works have been performed in Prague and Berlin. He is co-director of the Irish National Theatre Society. But few in this frumpy little town would know he was a writer, and fewer, if they knew, would care. His companion has appeared in three of his plays bit parts at first, but she was soon elevated to leads, past cold grey wavelets breaking on the stones, past the suck in the runnels of strand. And this is from the epilogue. <coughs> Old letter found among her papers unmailed. Duane's Inn and Grocery, near Carrarow, Cashla Bay, Connemara, Galway, 24th of July, 1907. Dearest Tramp. I'm after writing out your name and looking at the page a hundred years. I am unsure I should go on at all, or if you'd like a line or two from your bad old penny. So how are you keeping this weather, and you without me up in Dublin? Are you fading away like the morning dew? I hope you won't be thick with me now for writing and you're buried in your owl play like a miner. Tis midnight in Connemara. Downstairs they're at the drinking and the singing of sad songs. They live only for pleasure, the stony grey islanders and the dark deep sup of the blackness. It's said there's a storm coming. No one seems to care. An hour ago, a girl was singing The Lass of Rock Royale, and everything went still, oh, as still as the air, and you came drifting in and sat down by my window. I was thinking about the night in Cork City, when that old drunkard was singing it near the market. Do you remember his hands? They were like gnarled bits of bog oak. We were going somewhere or coming home. Was it after the theatre, maybe? And there was a fella too old to be begging and he collecting money in a cap and a dog on a rope with a scarf around his neck and yourself, Big Al Softheart, were crying. The sun would dry the oceans wide. Heaven should cease to be. The world will cease its motion, my love, ere I'd prove false to thee. I was thinking about when we quarrelled, you silly, jealous lunk. I hate it when we quarrel. It makes me afraid you want to leave me. 
I'd no more go with another fella. You are too silly a goose for words. I might play a little game of winks and bat my eyes, but that is all. And I'll quit it if you really do wish me to. The thought I'd make you unhappy, you bledering old baboon, when it's myself is at your mercy and always will be. And I hate it when you say I'd be better off with some easy-going chap. God, it makes me want to scream the face off, yes, so it does. Some harmless nice fella and his collars in a drawer and his mammy sewing him up for the winter. What would I do with him when it's my crabby owl scrivener I only want? You do say it for the divilment of maddening me, don't you? Didn't I know it the moment I saw you, before you'd ever given me the time of day? Long before you ever touched me, or even I heard your name spoken. Girls' nonsense, I hear you saying, never happens in life, only in storybooks and songs. And the queerest thing of all is, I agree with my tramper. I haven't hide nor hair of reasons for what's between us now. And if ever you wanted to quit your impatient girl truly, and our little story had to be put away in a room that's only sometimes remembered, well, that's still a room I'd want. And I'd go there now and again, like some room in an old hotel on a seafront someplace, where two sinners did something they shouldn't. Do you mind what I'm telling you? It is the God's honest truth. Even if I never saw you or heard from you again, you'd already have been the miracle of my life. Oh, I can see you rolling your 700-year-old eyes and saying I make it all sound like a novel for dressmakers, you bitter-mouthed old granny. But to find you in my mind at some moment of the morning, to see some sentence in a script, and wonder what my tramper would say to it, or to feel you glowing on like a lamp in my head, and to know I'd sleep in your arms that night. There's nothing in the world would ever give me the joy of that. Nothing in the great round world. You're forever at me to talk, only I'm sometimes afraid. The things I should have told you when we were walking Kalini Strand, like that knowing you is the greatest blessing of anything in my life. And I can't think up the phrases and the fiery words you'd have yourself. For there's not languages enough in all the living world to tell you of your preciousness to me. And everything about you gives me courage I never ever had. And without you, I'm like a ghost drifting through some old house of a life. And there's nothing about you I don't love. You are so kindly and good and wise and I love you and so patient and so loyal and so manly. So now you know all. Can I send you this letter? Are you reading it still? Am I gone mad? When we marry, can we go to America and stay there a time? That's if you still want me, my plough boy. Oh, wouldn't we be the nice pair of ornaments in New York or Brooklyn or some place? To flit away from this rainy sad land and the gossips and the dullards and the pokers of noses and old maids. There's times I think it'll choke us. If only we could go. In America, we would live to 150. Do you think I could ever play a lead in Boston or Chicago? Ah, oh, my tramper, wouldn't that be a thing entirely? We'd be two fools with the laughter and we traipsing down the Broadway and back to some little flat in the midnight. It makes me weep with heart's joy when I think I have found you and all the lover's adventures we will share. Do you know the way I've sometimes wept when we've been together alone? For all the pleasures you have given me have left me nothing else to do. That is how I feel this night. How I wish I had you here. I would measure your neck with my kisses. 
God, I can't sleep tonight. What is ailing your girl? Do you mind, you asked me one time to sing you a song, and I was nervous, for I hadn't had lessons. It was the first day we ever spoke to one another, in Sackville Street, by the post office. But if you were here, I'd sing it now. Would you like that, old tramper? Because the words on a page are only words on a page. But a song needs someone to love it by hearing. It was yourself told me that once. It was that night we were in Cork. An old runkard was singing it, and not a soul of the world listening. But you and me were. And it's in my head now. And as long as I live, and no matter what happens us, I'll hear it every time I hear the rain. The sun would dry the oceans wide. Heaven should cease to be. The world will cease its motion, my love, ere I would prove false to thee. Well, it's coming on for dawn. I better go to sleep. Do you think I should send this when you don't want interrupting? You're right, I shouldn't, but tomorrow I'm going to, as soon as the storm is over. Wish, I think it's lulling. Wait now till I listen. Everything is quiet, only the waves on the stones. It's little enough Irish I'll be learning today, I'm thinking. I can hear the terns calling, beautiful sound. Come with me up to the cliffs, and we'll watch them an hour. We won't say a word. Let the sea be all our talk. Just the gulls and the fishermen's boats heading out, and the trawl nets unrolling behind them. I kiss this paper, dear man. Touch it to your lips. I am half afraid to send it. I don't know why. The sun is coming up. Your changeling. There we are. Thank you very much. Oh, they knew how to write a letter in those days, didn't they? There was none of this texting nonsense. So, um, so I'm happy to take questions if anyone has one or comments. Yes, down the very front. Um, Ghost Light is um, the title. It's from a wonderful old theatrical superstition. You know how theatre folk love their superstitions and it's said that every theatre is haunted and there are the names of certain plays that can never be uttered inside a theatre. You know Shakespeare's play Macbeth, actors refer to as the Scottish play because it's believed that if you say the word Macbeth in a theatre um, something terrible will happen. In fact, I probably shouldn't have said it in here because the roof will fall in. But a, a go ghost light is a lovely old superstition that when the theatre is dark, when there isn't a play on, or when the theatre is closed for the night, that you must always leave one light burning on stage so that the theatre's ghosts can perform their own plays. So, you know, you be nice to the theatre's ghosts and they'll be nice to you. And that light is called a ghost light. And when I came across that, since it is a book about memory and how we carry the past, how we carry our ghosts, and how all of us have a kind of backstage in our mind. We're shuffling around the characters on it all the time. And sometimes we bring them out onto the front stage of our memory, and sometimes we're happy that they're in the backstage. Um, I just I thought that it was not just a lovely phrase, but one that would actually help me to write the book. It was a great help in deciding what the mixture of tones and textures in the book should be. So that's what a ghost light is. And it's still, for people who work in the theatre, I, um, I looked it up recently, and in the, the Oxford English Dictionary, the even in our age now, the very low wattage light bulb that's used backstage, you know, it hardly casts any light at all, it's so people can move around scenery, um, that's called a ghost light. It's, it's in the OED as one word, but it comes from that old theatrical superstition. It's a nice one, isn't it? Well, it's funny, I had three sort of goes at writing this book, and the first one was a fairly standard third-person, completely chronological story. And, you know, it was fine, but nothing particularly special, so I abandoned it after a while. And then I had um, a version where, um, 
where Singh is the narrator. You know, he's telling you the story, which is kind of an interesting experiment, but left a lot out. It was very self-justifying. And I found that when I was writing that second version, that every time this young, fiery, tempestuous woman from the slums of Dublin walked into a scene, that a kind of electricity would crackle through the page. And, and I realised this character, Molly, is trying to tell me, this is my book, you know, forget him. This is my story. So then I sort of seized on that. And um, just as an experiment one day, I started writing in the second person. You know, you go to the window, you look down into the street, you see the guy selling milk, you remember this. And there's a curious intimacy that comes with that tone that isn't there in the third person. Like the word, if you could sum up what we feel when we feel love, it's the word you. You know, love is the focus on you, on the second person. Um, and to use the word you about a character, I think means that you have a tenderness for them, a kind of respect and a sort of affection. So I liked that. Then I think you, the second person, is something that we unconsciously slip into all the time. We don't notice that we're doing it. But, you know, every day of the week we say, you know, when you're on your way into work and it's cold and you're late and, you know, we, it's just a natural sort of narrative form for us and we use it a lot. Children use it almost all the time. And then thirdly, I suppose, it was to highlight something that I think we all do. Like one of the ways we get through life is by having an imagination and by having a fantasy life. So sometimes we see the world through our own eyes, we're looking out at it. And sometimes we see ourselves as characters. Sometimes we see ourselves as in the third person. So I think that's just something that everybody does, but perhaps something that an actor does more than most. And this is a story about an actor. And an actor is somebody whose stock in trade is their ability to become someone else. And of course, the ability to know what it's like to be someone else, that act of profound empathy that is what the reader does when they read. That's what's at the core of the desire to read. That's why every society that has ever existed on the earth, there's been somebody whose job is to tell stories because there's some deeply human need in us to escape from ourselves for a defined length of time and to know what it's like to be somebody else. And in any kind of story, from a sitcom to a soap opera, to James Joyce's high literary fiction, that is what is at the heart of it. And the irony, the paradox of fiction is that once we do that, once we experience what it's like to be somebody else briefly, we come back to ourselves with a greater sense of what it's like to be us. You know, it's a remarkable thing. So I thought that the use of the second person would acknowledge that, and I suppose would acknowledge the great, the central role of the reader in any novel. You know, I, I always think what the reader does is far more radical and creative than what the writer does. I, I personally think we have enough great writers in the world. We need more great readers. Um, when, when you look at what a book is, you know, whether it's, whether it's on Kimble or Kindle or whatever it is, whether it's a traditional book, you know, it's a collection of ink stains on a page. And what the reader does is to take those and play them, turn them into the movie, turn them into the experience. You know, the great John McGahern, who you and I were talking about earlier, he said this all the time, that the novelist only does half of the work. And I always try in my novels uh, not to make the reader work, but to provide a kind of three-dimensionality, to provide a sort of structure that the reader walks into and you can walk around and touch the walls and the floor of the story. Um, and there's something about the use of the second person that I think allows for that. I mean, I, I've come to think really of a novel as being like sheet music. What you're doing is writing sheet music and you give it to the reader and the reader sings the song, you know, and you must never forget that as, as an author. Because once you, once you forget the reader, the book immediately turns to ashes, you know? So there's something about the playful use of you 
that invites the reader in. I suppose it was a choice, really. I mean, my first three or four books were about people of my age and my experience and my background. A lot of them were about young people in London or in America in the 1980s. And I suppose I, I sort of felt, having written three or four of those books, that um, for better or worse, I'd, I'd said whatever I had, to, whatever very small um, amount I had to say about that. And I was interested in the notion of how some of the realities, some of the hidden stories of the Irish past are very fascinating and reveal a lot about our world now. So I decided about 10 years ago I was going to have a go at writing three novels um, that were, were about forgotten corners of the Irish past. And one, the first one was called Star of the Sea, which is set uh, in the era of the Irish famine. And then there was one called Redemption Falls, which is set in the 1860s, and it looks at immigrants here in the United States um, who are touched in one way or another by the American Civil War. And then there's this book. But to me, you know, I've been writing about outsiders for a very long time and rebels, and I think Molly Allgood, the hero of this book, would be quite at home meeting Eddie Virago, who's the sort of Mohican-wearing punk rocker in my first book who also goes to London to pursue a career in the arts. So I think of them sometimes as a great big party, uh, all of my characters, you know, they're like distant cousins who have a lot of things in common, um, only one of which is love. Um, so this is the third historical book and I've, you know, I've decided that my next book is going to be contemporary. I don't know what it's going to be just yet. But um, I'm glad I did it. There's, I mean, it's a challenge. There's a particular set of challenges you have to meet when you're writing historical fiction, mainly to do with the facts. You know, readers, um, if you write a novel that refers to a factual situation or a real-life place, a real-life geography, um, readers love you to get it right, and they're very unforgiving if you get it wrong. <coughs> I had a contemporary novel published a few years ago, it's not published here in the United States, called Inish Owen, uh, set in a place that some of you might know, the Inish Owen Peninsula in County Donegal in Ireland. And about halfway through that book, I have a scene where a couple walk down a street in Inish Owen and I say they turn left at the Catholic Church and they turn right and they pass the pub and off they go. So I get a letter from a woman who lives in Inish Owen <laughs> saying, you know, I loved your book, I've loved all of your books, I'm your number one fan, but then I got to page 202 of your novel, <laughs> in a show, and, and everybody knows that when you turn down that street and you turn left, that's the Protestant church, it's not the Catholic church. You turn right, it isn't the pub, it's the cinema car park, and it ruined the whole book for me. She said, I couldn't believe a single word in the book after that. Um, in historical fiction, that problem is compounded, of course, because there, you have to be very careful, for example, of, um, of anachronisms, of characters using words that have not yet been invented, or knowing things that have not yet been discovered. Um, and in the privacy of this room, since we're all gathered together on a cold night, I'll tell you a few of them. I mean, in Star of the Sea, uh, which is, as I say, a novel about the Irish famine, and it's set in 1847, largely on a ship uh, that's journeying from Ireland to New York. And in the opening scene, it's very, very sad, very tragic, very operatic, and the central character of the book, a man called Pius Mulvey, is standing on the deck of the ship at night, and everybody back in Ireland is dying, and everyone on the ship is in a very bad way, and he's leaving Ireland, he's never going to see it as long as he lives, and he's just drifting past the last few coastal islands into the great unknown. So I, I thought, just to sophisticate the scene slightly, so, so it's not unremittingly tragic, I'll give him one little warm memory to take with him. So it's a cold, clear night, a bit like tonight, and he's looking, he's standing on the deck of the ship, he's looking up at the twinkling stars, and he remembers that when he was a lad in school, the schoolmaster taught them a little memory device for remembering the sequence of the planets from the sun in the solar system. So he looks up at the stars and he remembers. 
and the, the device is Mary's violet eyes make John sit up nights praying. And the initial letter of each of those words is one of the planets in the solar system. So he takes this off to America with him and it's lovely. So the book comes out and a guy writes to me from, you know, the British Astrological Society <laughs> to say, we, we have a problem here, you know. <laughs> because he said, um, Mary's violet eyes make John sit up nights praying. Praying is P for Pluto. Pluto was discovered in the 1920s. Um, this book is set in 1847. And I, in fact, I read this summer with some joy that we're still not absolutely sure about Pluto. <laughs> it may, there's something out there, but we don't know if it's Pluto, but certainly nobody knew it was there in 1847. So the book became successful, thank God, and was reprinted. So I, I took that out. Um, so it's Mary's violet eyes make John sit up nights. Um, and then the same wretch, he could have told me this the first time, he writes to me again <laughs> to say there's, there's still a problem um, because Mary's violet eyes make John sit up nights. Um, nights is for Neptune. And Neptune was discovered in 1847, the year in which your novel is set. So you're telling me that this poor, starving, illiterate peasant from Connemara you know, he's keeping up with all the scientific journals. You know, he's remarkably well informed about planetary discoveries. Um, so it was as though with, with every reprint of the book, the solar system was getting smaller. Um, so you have to watch for things like that. I remember another one now. I'm confessing all my uh, misdemeanors in that book. Um, there's a scene in which a poor man is on a mountainside in Connemara during the famine in 1847 and he hears a wolf howling in the distance which I thought was just a sort of standard issue evocative sound and um, and a, a guy really does write to me from you know the Irish Wolf Appreciation Society um, to say that that couldn't have happened because as everybody knows um, anytime someone writes to you and t to tell you something that nobody knows it always begins with as everybody knows um, he said the last wolf in Ireland was shot in 1791 and and here's a picture of the wolf, here's a picture of the guy who shot him, here's how much he weighed uh, and at the instigation of my, my lovely father, Sean, I did something that I hardly ever do and I wrote back, uh, I said thank you for writing to me, I'm sorry to disappoint you but that, that must have been the second last wolf in Ireland because <laughs> the last wolf in Ireland is in my book in 1847 so um, so you have to be careful about those things. And then I suppose on a more serious level, uh, um, having written three historical books now, um, I've come to wonder if the people of the past felt about things in quite the way that we do. You know, the world of the middle of the 19th century, for example, Star of the Sea or Redemption Falls, is so unimaginable to us. The world has changed so much um, if you were to think of a family now with two children, if one of them died, that would be the most horrendous tragedy. I don't know if they would ever get over it, but there would be counselling and there would be a whole structure for people to deal with their grief. In Ireland, in the middle of the 19th century, people had 10 and 12 and 14 children and they often died. And it's not to say that there wasn't grief, I'm sure there was, but I wonder, was it the same? You know, I wonder, did people fall in love in the same way or mourn in the same way or be happy or sad in the same way? When, when you think that the world of Jane Austen or the world of the Brontes, the world of the great English novels, is the world before Freud gave us an insight into how we think and it's the world before Marx, it's the world before parliamentary democracy, it's the world before literacy for for most people. Um, and the things that we completely take for granted now, the things that have shaped how we feel and given us a language in which to express our feelings just didn't exist at the time. So I, I think that's a huge challenge for anybody writing about the past because of course a novel can't be a museum piece. You know, it can't just be um, a lecture, you know, interesting things that you found in the library. It has to be about our experience now, otherwise it won't work. Um, but at the same time, you have to be very, very careful that you're not 
projecting from our world onto the past. Sometimes you read historical novels where the characters are talking to each other as though they were, you know, people in Friends. Um, and, and, you know, they don't work for that reason. So you have to sort of steer away between those, those two extremes. It's quite difficult. Well, you know, I think we're lucky in Ireland because one of the cliches about Irish life that is actually true is that people still have an enormous interest in literature and book sales in Ireland in various different modes are still very high. If you look at our bestsellers list, you would often see a book of, you know, difficult poetry or very serious literary fiction at number one. You know, Seamus Heaney published a book this year, it was number one in the bestsellers list, um, ahead of the John Grishams and, you know, all of those books. Not to decry anybody's books, but it's just an interesting, unusual thing. If Colm Tobin publishes a novel, it's a big bestseller in Ireland. Sebastian Barry's uh, last book sold 300,000 copies in Ireland. You know, and it's quite a difficult book. It's an absolute masterpiece, but this is not, you know, bestseller material perhaps in other countries. So, you know, I think we're lucky to that extent, but the book trade is very difficult everywhere. I mean, it's very difficult here in the United States where, you know, a Barnes and Noble comes into town and it's it becomes almost impossible for the local independent bookseller who can only survive by having a very loyal clientele, you know. So I think we have that in Ireland. We have enough of a loyalty to our local bookstores. Kenny's in Galway, a fantastic place. Um, it is a shame that it's closed, but what they did with um, electronic bookselling and so on really was a pioneering thing. I think they're the first bookseller in Europe um, to do that, so they continue. So that, you know, the trade changes, but thankfully all over Ireland and in Europe generally, I think there still is an audience for for literary fiction, if it must be called that. I mean, the other great thing in Ireland is, of course, that those terms aren't used quite as much. You know, I, I remember as a kid, it was a really inspiring thing to me that we had a writer like Roddy Doyle, who people just loved. You know, kids would buy his books, people who didn't read much would buy his books, and then he went and won the Booker Prize. You know, so he really, here along came a writer who just ignored the categories and it just, you know, covered the waterfront. Um, so, so you know, somebody like that was very important to me. I, I don't think in those categories myself when I'm writing. I, I think it's a great notion that's there in the American literary tradition, I must say, perhaps more than in ours. Um, there was always a notion here that for a novel to be truly great, for a novel to be really a classic, um, it had to be capable of being read by anybody, you know, a Harvard professor or a general reader. And when you read Steinbeck and Hemingway and all of those writers, they believed in story and character and they believed in making their books page turners and they often wrote about the so-called very ordinary people. Um, in Ireland, we believed in a set of very interesting but different things. We believed that a novel should be beautiful, it should be lyrical, there should be music in the language. But we weren't actually always brilliant literary storytellers. A lot of Irish novels, you know, the lyricism gets in the way. So when, when I was a kid starting to write, I loved American novelists, and I still do. You know, I just love that notion that's part of an American democratic tradition that a work of art, you know, ideally should be accessible. So, you know, I'm writing for everybody. And I think particularly younger writers in Ireland, that's very much how they think. And that's one of the reasons why book selling goes on. You know, we have an audience for them. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I was a bit mischievous about the portrayal of Yeats, I suppose. There's a scene in the book I'm quite fond of where uh, Yeats, who's incredibly, I mean, Yeats is obviously a great genius, but a strange man. He used to lecture the actors at the Abbey that they must not try to be entertaining, um, that the worst thing an actor can be is entertaining. He said, praise may be the result of our work, it must never be the aim. <laughs> and um, so you have an interesting conflict, I suppose, as the Abbey Theatre is born, and a rather fantastic one 
that on the one hand you have Yeats and Singh and Lady Gregory, who believe that theatre is to express the soul of the nation and the glory of the Irish people. And then you have people like Molly Allgood and her sister, Sarah Allgood, who became a Hollywood actress in the end, who are from the tenements of Dublin and who don't have servants at home like, like Yeats and Singh do, and who feel, God, this is show business, this is great, and we might meet handsome fellas who'll bring us off to America. And Molly used to drive Yeats absolutely crazy because when she wasn't cast in a play at the Abbey, um, she would go and audition to be in the pantomime in Dublin. Um, and she saw absolutely no contradiction between the, those two things, as, as, I, as I might not myself, you know? So I think it's sort of supercharged the Abbey with an amazing tension right right from the beginning. And it's really what animated it and m made it such an important institution. That said, you know, in the years after Singh's death in real life, M Molly was really written out of Singh's story. She was a very, very important person in his life, which means she's a very important person in our literature. There's clear textual evidence that she collaborated with him to some extent on the Playboy of the Western world. Certainly they discussed the central role which was specifically written for her. Um, when Singh died, he left his last play, Deirdre of the Sorrows, uncompleted, and Molly and Yeats stitched it together from, you know, hundreds of pages of notes. Must have been a very interesting series of meetings. Um, so I, I think she was a hugely important presence, but precisely because of all the boundaries of class and background that the relationship transgressed, there were anxieties about it on both sides. You know, Molly's family in the inner city of Dublin feel, what's this posh guy um, who's 37, what's he doing hanging around with our 18-year-old daughter? And is this some kind of adventure he's after? before he settles down with a woman of his own class. And then Singh's own family um, have a horror of the theatre arising from sort of puritanical religious views. They have a sort of Victorian notion really that the theatre is the liar's house. The theatre theater is the den of Satan. Actresses are prostitutes. And it's an amazing, very sad reality that at the time of his death, Singh, who is the first great genius of the 20th century in Irish drama, um, not one of his family had ever seen one of his plays because they wouldn't enter a theatre. So in the years after his death, all of Molly's letters to him disappear. You know, she, we know that she wrote him about 400 love letters. And as she aged and fell into poverty a bit, she would sell them back to the family um, ostensibly for his archive, but they destroyed them all um, to obliterate any evidence that this relationship had ever taken place. And those of you who've been to the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, you know, you go up a very grand staircase there, and there's a big portrait of Yeats, there's a portrait of O'Casey, there's portraits of Brian Friel, and up until recently, if you wanted to see a portrait of Molly Allgood, who was, after all, in at the very beginning, a very heroic woman, you know, you had to go upstairs and turn left and through the bar and past the restroom and towards the emergency exit. And so if, if my novel has achieved nothing else, um, shortly before I came here to the US to begin my book tour, I got an email from uh, Fiac McAneil, who runs the Abbey Theatre, who said, um, you know that portrait of, of Molly that was hidden away? Well, we, we're moving it now into the main hallway and it's going to hang there beside Singh. So I feel, you know, that Molly, who was an actress and who had a little bit of an ego, you know, as some actors do, I think she'd be quite happy um, to finally be moved to where she belongs. Well, you're very astute, if I may say so, because um, I did with this book what I always do, which is I make a start and I write about 10,000 words and then I stop and I think my way down to the end of the story. So I thought, this is a story that's going to have darkness and it's about someone who's elderly and okay, she's looking back on happy days in her life. But in the present day of the book, in the 1950s, you know, things have not worked out. Molly, 
you know, in real life and in the novel. She was married twice. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, you know, neither marriage went very well because she was really in love with Singh. Um, her only son was a pilot in the RAF. He was killed during the war. So it's a story about a lonely woman. And I just thought, I don't want to get to the end of the book and leave her there. I don't want to maroon her there in 1952 with all of the great things behind her. That I want to finish the book with a great sparkling river of love. With all of the folly and all of the innocence and all of the stupidity that we all felt when we were that age and we fell in love. And, you know, our mother thought it was inappropriate, as Molly's mother does. I mean, it's really about a story about a woman who falls for somebody that her mother doesn't like. When you're 19, your friends don't like the person you're in love with and your parents don't like them. It's absolutely great. And the more they don't like them, the more great it is. And I, I think it's something that we write about quite well in Ireland, that particular side of love. It's beautiful when Yeats says in his great poem, down by the Sally Gardens, but I, being young and foolish, with her could not agree. I mean, this is a poem about the nobility of love, how serene and how wonderful love is, but about the foolishness as well, you know? So I thought to end the book with a celebration of that, so that the last thing the reader sees, and I mean, the reader's not a fool. The reader knows this is the, wor the writing of a very young, very naive, woman and it's not going to work out but at the same time that there's something heroic about it um, just to end with a great sort of explosion of, of love is the, is the last image that I wanted to, to see of her so, so, I w so I wrote that and then I went back and joined the dots it was a bit more complicated than that but that's yeah I mean it's always good to have a destination you know whenever I teach writing which I do from time to time I do encourage my students to have the ending, if at all possible. It, it comes from very painful experiences in my own early writing life when, you know, my first book, which is called Cowboys and Indians, was published in 1991, but it's actually my fourth or fifth go at a first novel. And my problem was always that I would write too much and they would just get bigger and bigger and more baggy and more absurd. Um, there's a wonderful place in County Monaghan in Ireland called Anna McCarrick. I don't know if any of you know that. It's a great big Victorian house that was owned by Sir Tyrone Guthrie, great theatre director, the cousin of Tyrone Power, the movie star. And when Tyrone Guthrie died, he left his house to the writers and artists of Ireland. Um, there's a foolish thing to do. Um, and it's administered through the Arts Council, the Irish government. As a, play, as a writer's retreat, you go there and you work on your novel or your painting or your piece of music. And I remember going there with one of my early stabs at a novel. It was 250,000 words and I didn't have an ending. So I went to Anna McCarrick for three weeks and I said, I won't leave until I get an ending. And the days ticked by and by and by and suddenly it was the day before I had to leave um, and go back to London where I was living. And there's a lake there in the grounds with a rowboat. So I thought, I get into the rowboat, I row into the middle of the lake, and I won't come in from the middle of the lake till I have the ending. So I rowed out to the middle of the lake, I put up the oars, I started smoking, the boat circled round in the water, I smoked all the cigarettes, and after about two hours, I actually did have a very important revelation, which is there's no ending. Um, this has just been a colossal waste of your time. <laughs> uh, what you've got to do now is put the oars back in, row back up to the bank, walk up to the beautiful Victorian house, get the 250,000 words, throw it in the trash, because otherwise you'll spend the next 40 years of your life with this thing just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so that's what I did. And everything that I've written from then on, whether it's a book review, whether it's a note to the milkman, practically, I, th I have the ending before I really get going. Because you need to have a destination. And like any journey, you know, the destination can change. There are all sorts of circuitous ways that you can get there. But you need to know where you're, where you're aiming. And in, in this case, once I got Molly's voice there in that letter, it was a, it was a huge help. 
it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much for coming along. <laughs>